Well, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for being here tonight. I'm Patrice Kelch, and I use she, her pronouns. And I'm here for um, Shelley. And they are uh, graduating from the IMS teacher training this week. So Shelley will be a fully authorized teacher from the Insight Meditation Society uh, at the end of the week, of the four-year training period. So I'm happy to uh, support them by being here this evening and offering some Dharma reflections um, to you. Um, is there anyone here who's new this evening for the first time? Could you just wave or unmute yourself? I too have been having connectivity problems that um, this morning I was sent to a Zoom room. I was in a meeting and instead I was booted out of the Zoomiverse. So I got here really early tonight, hoping that my connection would work because it has been sort of unpredictable. But I'm really happy to see you. Anyone else here new this evening? Really, really happy to, to have you here. Thank you. Um, tonight. So I first just want to acknowledge that I'm here in Minneapolis and I live pretty close to Common Ground, uh, the actual center. And so I'm speaking to you from uh, Dakota land. And this is particularly sacred Dakota land. It's very, very near the Bedote and other sacred sites in, in Minnesota. And uh, I guess it was about a month and a half ago, I was at um, a demonstration um, for the water protectors, a kind of indigenous led um, demonstration. And um, one of the speakers said that an elder had asked him, what's the first thing you do when you get out of bed in the morning? And the answer was, you step on stolen land. And I think as practitioners, now we take the non-harming precepts pretty seriously. And the second precept is the precept not to take anything that's not freely given. So I really think about that in the morning when I get up and and meditate that you know, the first thing I do is I step on stolen land and I hold that um, in my heart with an intention of doing whatever repair work with a great deal of remorse and whatever repair work I can. So I just invite you to hold that in, uh, in your hearts too as we, as we have our, our discussion tonight. And I'll be talking about compassion and um, kind of a continuation of last week. I mentioned that the two wings of our Dharma practice are wisdom and compassion. So last week I talked about wisdom and this week I'll talk about compassion. But first we're going to sit for about half an hour and I would just invite you to have an aspiration for, uh, for this sitting. Um, the aspiration might, bring, might be to bring your whole self into the room tonight, into your meditation, not having to leave out any of the parts that aren't so appealing. So that might be one aspiration. Another aspiration might just be to bring your wholeheartedness to whatever arises and passes away. So just come up with a little reflection, a little aspiration, and then as we sit, sit with great kindness toward yourself 
having an aspiration is in and of itself a noble act. So instead of judging yourself throughout the, the meditation, if you can appreciate the nobility and the goodness of your aspiration, and maybe come back to that as a touchstone. So I'll ring the bell once at the beginning and once at the end, and that will just be a sound that helps us kind of collect ourselves. And you are certainly welcome to turn off your video while we meditate, if you are more comfortable doing that. It's always nice to see each other in the gallery, but um, do what seems kind and supportive for yourself. And as the sound of the bell fades, you can just collect as best you can any scattered energy and just let it come into the body. And if it's possible, let it settle. Just inhabiting this mind body with its energies, with its vitality, and having that sense of gratitude just to be here together, giving support to each other, getting support from each other. And while you are certainly welcome to engage in any practice that would seem to be beneficial to you in this moment during this time period, I would just offer the suggestion that so often practice is a kind of doing and has a flavor of striving that if it seems right for you tonight, you can just experiment with a practice of being, of a kindly receptive awareness that allows things to arise and pass away, noting them perhaps moment to moment, but just allowing this receptive spacious quality as if you are lying on the earth, looking up at the sky.
And if it seems right for you, I would encourage you for the last few minutes of our meditation together that you offer some loving kindness to yourself, to loved ones, to persons who move your heart. Having this wholesome concern for the welfare of others. Wishing that ourselves and others would be safe and protected in all ways. Free from all inner and outer harm. That we would find strength and peace. And that we would be able to accept ourselves completely and with great kindness, just as we are right now.
Thank you for your sincere practice. Feel free to stretch a little bit to have a sip of water or do whatever your body needs. When I was uh, with you last week, I talked about how our Dharma practice is sometimes characterized as a bird that needs two wings to fly. And those are the, the wings of wisdom and compassion. And without compassion, wisdom is kind of aloof and disconnected. And without wisdom, compassion is often diffuse and ineffective. And in the story of the Buddha's awakening, um, it's a very, a very curious story, what happens right after the Buddha's awakening. The Buddha is at first um, reluctant to teach. And I'm going to read how it how that story appears in, uh, in the Pali Canon. So the Buddha says, I considered this Dhamma that I have attained is profound, hard to see, hard to understand, peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning subtle, to be experienced by the wise. But this population delights in attachment, takes delight in attachment, rejoices in attachment. It is hard for such a population to see this truth, namely specific conditionality, dependent origination. And it is hard to see this truth namely the stilling of all formations, the relinquishing of all acquisitions, the destruction of craving, dispassion, cessation, nibbana. If I were to teach the Dhamma, others would not understand me and that would be wearying and troublesome for me. Therefore, there came to me spontaneously these stanzas never heard before. Enough with the teaching, enough with teaching the Dhamma that even I found hard to reach, for it will never be perceived by those who live in lust and hate. Those died in lust, wrapped in darkness, will never discern this abstruse Dhamma, which goes against the worldly stream, subtle, deep, and difficult to see. Considering thus, my mind inclined to inaction rather than to teaching the Dhamma. And then the story is that um, a Brahma, one of the celestial beings, uh, intuits this about the Buddha, that the Buddha is not going to teach. So the, the, uh, the Brahma God appears to the Buddha and says, Venerable Sir, let the blessed one teach the Dhamma. Let the sublime one teach the Dhamma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes who are perishing through not hearing the Dhamma. There will be, be those who will understand the Dhamma. So then the Buddha says, I listened to the, to the Brahma's pleading and here's the key out of compassion for beings, I surveyed the world with the eye of a Buddha. Surveying the world with the eye of a Buddha, I saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes, with keen faculties and with dull faculties, with good qualities and with bad qualities, easy to teach 
and hard to teach, and some who dwelled seeing fear and blame in the other world. Just as a pond with blue or red or white lotuses, some lotuses that are born and grow in the water, immersed in the water without rising out of it. Some other lotuses that are born and grow in the water and rest on the water's surface. And some other lotuses that are born and grow in the water and rise out of the water and stand clear, unwetted by it. So too, surveying the world with the eye of a Buddha, I saw beings with little dust in their eyes and with much dust in their eyes and with keen faculties and with dull faculties, with good qualities and bad qualities, easy to teach and hard to teach, and some who dwelled seeing fear and blame in the other world. And so the Buddha decides out of compassion to teach. And this is to me a really interesting and kind of curious story. And it's you know, has all the qualities of myth with a Brahma God kind of appearing to, to the Buddha. But the Buddha is at first um, reluctant to teach. And it's interesting in this, in the Theravadan tradition, there are awakened ones who are solitary. Um, and these are called Pacheka Buddhas. And many years ago, I, I had a discussion with Gil Fransdahl, and I said, no, doesn't, uh, doesn't a Buddha have to be compassionate? And he said, no, there's the tradition of the Pacheka Buddhas. And the Pacheka Buddhas are solitary um, beings. They're independently enlightening, enlightened. They kind of go off as hermits, and they have an understanding, a penetrating understanding of, um, of clinging. They have a, an understanding of the conditionality of the world. When this happens, that happens, of the suffering involved by clinging. But they don't have the capacity or the inclination to teach the Dhamma. And that's really interesting to me that there are these throughout history, solitary, solitary beings who have kind of the wisdom to uh, understand how suffering occurs, but not the inclination, or sometimes it's said, the capacity to teach. And when this celestial being kind of challenges the Buddha and says, no, there are many people with only a little dust in their eyes who would really benefit from the teachings. The Buddha, um, out, of, out of compassion, decides that he will, will teach. And if you read through the, the suttas, one of the things that um, may strike you is how differently the Buddha responds to different audiences that um, many people have commented that, you know, the, the Buddha was just a really great intuitive teacher a really understanding what simile would make the teachings clear what sort of language would make the teachings clear. And he was also really emphatic that the teachings had to be in the vernacular. There's a, a great sutta where um, some of the monks say that they should uh, put the Buddha's words into kind of classical meter and make them very dignified. And the Buddha really chastises them and says, you know, it's really important to, to teach in, in the vernacular, to teach in a way that one would understand. So the Buddha has this awakening, but it's really this intervention of another being that causes his compassion to, to arise. And I think this is something that I'd like for us to discuss, this idea that compassion arises out of a kind of relationship, that compassion arises when we engage with um, with another. So I'd like us to um, investigate this this evening, what compassion is and how it arises. Um, many of you know that compassion is one of the four Brahma Viharas and Brahma Vihara means heavenly dwelling. And these are 
four states of mind that one of which is always accessible to us. And the first is loving kindness or metta, and that's a kind of friendly concern for the welfare of all, the welfare of ourselves and others. The second, compassion, which in Pali is karuna, is the recognition of suffering and the desire to alleviate it. It's not just seeing the suffering, but it also has this desire to alleviate that suffering. The third is um, appreciative joy, mudita, which is gladness in good fortune or happiness. And finally, equanimity, upeka. And that's a kind of steadfastness, a balance between falling into extremes. So one of those, the Buddha says, is always available to us. And often it's in times of uh, you know, great distress and turmoil, what we, we try to find refuge in a more equanimous state in finding that kind of steadfastness, that ability, that confidence that we can work with whatever, whatever is presented. So this is how we um, encounter compassion in, in early Buddhism. It's not talked about as one of the 10 virtues. It's talked about as this kind of um, state of mind. Now, Sharon Salzberg talks about compassion as um, a kind of a, a way of being in the world, which I think is a really, really helpful uh, idea. Compassion is a way of being in the world. Each one of the beneficial states of mind, each one of the Brahma Viharas has what's called a near and a far enemy. And the far enemy is always the opposite of that characteristic. So for example, in loving kindness, the opposite of that would be hatred. Um, and, uh, and then each of these qualities has what's called a near enemy. And the near enemy disguises itself or masquerades itself as that, um, as that other quality. So for example, the, um, the near enemy in loving kindness is going to be attachment. The near enemy in compassion is pity. So the far enemy of compassion is cruelty. Really easy to, to see how that's not compassion. The harder one to discern is pity. And that's the, the near enemy. And what happens when we experience pity, pity others, the person who is suffering. It puts distance and disconnection. So, you know, we, we pity someone, it happened to that person, that being, we pull away. And we see that, that person as other, not me. And um, Christina Feldman and Chris Cullen have a, a really nice article about uh, compassion where they talk about the antidote to this othering is to always say, just like me. When we see it's just like me, possible for me. Um, so we, we really keep our antennae out for, for othering. Etymologically, the Pali word for compassion, karuna, it suggests a kind of um, quivering of the heart in response to suffering just as um, the string of a, a lute would, um, would quiver. It's a quivering of the heart. It's as if the strings of the heart have been plucked, which I think is a, a really um, potent um, image. And you know, it's so immediate and visceral. So when we have this, this moment of compassion, this quivering of the heart, it is a just like me moment 
we see in the suffering of another, ah, I know what this is. It's a kind of, of um, recognition. And Sharon Salzberg has another really um, beautiful observation that I found, again, really helpful to myself. She says, attention is the doorway to compassion. Attention is the doorway to compassion. When we really pay attention to another, another being, and it might be someone that we, we dislike. We have a really annoying coworker. Um, when we really pay attention and try to understand how it is to be that person, when we see the conditionality of that person's life, when we really pay attention, that really is the doorway to compassion. So here's again where wisdom kind of uh, comes into play because in our mindfulness practice, what we're really doing is bringing a really clear attention to what's going on in the moment. And it's that attention which really kind of prepares us to have a heart that is able to, to respond to um, another. Um, there's an archetype for uh, compassion that is primarily in other, uh, other Buddhist traditions. It's not so prominent in the, in fact, it's not prominent at all in the traditional Theravadan tradition, but a lot of times in the insight tradition, um, we acknowledge this, again, a kind of, of mythical archetype, archetype um, of Kuan Yin. And um, I know that Shelley has been doing a Kuan Yin chant in here. And, um, and I, I love Kuan Yin. I have several different um, figurines of, of Kuan Yin. And uh, Kuan Yin is the archetypal bodhisattva of uh, compassion. Um, it's she who hears the cries of, of the world. And sometimes she's portrayed as having a hundred arms and each arm, sometimes in each, as the arms are extended, you see in the palm of the, the hand, there's an eye. So she sees all the trouble in the world, but sometimes um, Kuan Yin uh, has in each hand, a different kind of tool. Sometimes it's a medicine, uh, sometimes it's um, a tool to free someone from, from someone else. And recently someone said, um, you know, attempt, uh, that uh, Kuan Yin would be holding a Black Lives Matter sign right now, uh, a way to address the, the cries of, of the world. Um, So the obstacle to compassion, to hearing the cries of the world, to being open to the suffering of another is really this othering. It's what we do when we separate ourselves. And you know, when you, when you look um, historically, for example, at genocide, what you discover is that one group talks about the other as if that other group is not human. You know, the way the Nazis talked about the Jews, they were subhuman. The way people um, talked about enslaved people, they were not human, didn't, didn't feel the way uh, white people felt. So we see this over and over and over again, this kind of othering. It's the othering that enables us to to really do tremendous harm. And it's one of our um, obligations, I think, as practitioners to bring more and more mindfulness and clarity to our own, um, our own othering, our own implicit bias, to really tease out all the ways that we separate ourselves um, from others. And we also, need to recognize the conditionality 
of our experience, of all human experience. So I mentioned uh, a little earlier that, you know, if you have an annoying coworker, you might try to understand, excuse me, um, you know, what is, what is causing the coworker to do whatever it is that, that they're doing. But I think sometimes when we, um, when we imagine, when we contemplate someone and have a real aversion to that person, wisdom asks us to reflect how it is that that person became that person. That, you know, we, we are all who we are out of a whole constellation of causes and, and conditions. And sometimes those causes are multi-generational. Sometimes there is multi-generational trauma. And a lot of times that's invisible to us. So when we, we think about someone, how could this person be so despicable? How could this person be so callous? Um, you know, it's really our wisdom that will ask us to reflect on the causes and conditions that brought that person to that, um, to that state. And um, some of you may remember a couple of weeks um, ago, Shelley talked about Angulimala, the uh, murderer who encountered the Buddha. And upon encountering the Buddha, um, had remorse for what he had done and had become, uh, became a monk. But even though Angulimala was a monk, you know, the people still, when Angulimala went out on his alms round, the people threw stones at, uh, at Angulimala and didn't want to give him food. And he, you know, talks to the Buddha about this and the Buddha says, you know, this is, this is your karma. This is the consequence of the evil that you have done, even though he had remorse. So uh, we shouldn't think about um, our compassion as something that um, gets in the way of, of justice, that we want justice and we want compassion. I want to um, read a poem to you by Thich Nhat Hanh. And this is a poem that some of you have probably heard before. It's, um, it's a really challenging poem. It's called, Call Me By My True Names. And I will read it twice. <clears throat> and if anyone um, if, is not familiar with Thich Nhat Hanh, Thich Nhat Hanh is a, a Zen monk. He is Vietnamese. He was really instrumental during the Vietnam War in trying to bring about peace between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. And consequently, he was exiled for many years in France and couldn't live in Vietnam. And he is now in his 90s and he has gone back to Vietnam and he is in very, very fragile health. Um, but he, uh, he's been a great teacher for, for many, many people. So this is his poem, Call Me By My True Names. Do not say that I'll depart tomorrow because even today I still arrive. Look deeply. I arrive in every second to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with wings still fragile, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, in order to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that are alive. I am the mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the river, and I am the bird which when spring comes, arrives in time to eat the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in the clear pond 
and I am also the grass snake who approaching in silence feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12 year old girl refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Politburo with plenty of power in my hands. And I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom in all walks of life. My pain is like a river of tears, so full it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and laughs at once so I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door to my heart can be left open, the door of compassion. I'm gonna read this again. I usually think any, any poem worth reading is worth reading twice. So call me by my true names. Do not say that I'll depart tomorrow because even today I still arrive. Look deeply. I arrive in every second to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with wings still fragile, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, in order to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that are alive. I am the mayfly metamorphosing on the surface of the water. And I am the bird, which when spring comes, arrives in time to eat the mayfly. I'm the frog swimming happily in the clear pond. And I'm also the grass snake who approaching in silence feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the 12 year old girl, refugee on a small boat who throws herself in the ocean after being raped by a sea pirate. And I am the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I am a member of the Politburo with plenty of power in my hands. And I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom in all walks of life. My pain is like a river of tears so full it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I can hear all my cries and laughs at once, so I can see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door to my heart can be left open, the door of compassion. So I'd like to, us to talk about that. But before we do that, I have something else I want to share. And this is a story that I heard several years ago that has just had such a lasting impression on me. True story that there was um, a monk in Tibet who was imprisoned by the Chinese and held for many, many years. And um, 
he was beaten and he was tortured during his imprisonment. And finally, in a very fragile state after many years, he was freed and he made his way to Dharamsala and met with the Dalai Lama, who was just overcome with compassion for all this, all this man had suffered, how terribly he had suffered during those many years of, of captivity. And um, the Dalai Lama asked him how it was for him. And he said, how, how was it for you during that time? And the monk said, most of that time, I was very, very afraid. And the Dalai Lama asked him, were you afraid for your life? Were you afraid because of the tortures? And the monk said, no. I was afraid I would lose my compassion for the Chinese. I mean, what an astonishing story. I mean, it just, um, it just thrilled me in some ways because to think that a human being was capable of that, that frame of mind that that's what he was afraid that he would lose his compassion for the Chinese. And the more I've thought about that over the years, I've thought of, I really asked my, myself the question of what is it to be afraid to lose his compassion for the Chinese? What, what does that mean? What would it mean for him if he lost his compassion? I mean, that, that's just so, so interesting that that was so integral to him that his fear was he would lose his compassion for the Chinese. And what did that compassion consist in? So I would really love to hear uh, your reflections on either the poem or that story or anything else that um, I've offered this evening. I'm happy to entertain questions, but also your reflections are uh, just as welcome. So just please um, unmute yourself and, um, and share. One of the places where we see pity sometimes is um, you know, when someone else has um, some sort of medical condition and uh, it's, it's really hard to imagine ourselves having that um, condition. You know, it, it can be really scary sometimes. Um, I encountered this sort of a pity idea um, years before I came to Buddhism and uh, the literary critic, Leslie Fiedler, uh, wrote a book called Freaks. And one of his theories was that um, our fascination sort of with circus freaks was that um, they sort of represented, um, you know, a possibility for us, but fortunately it wasn't us. And I, I found that really compelling at, at the time. And I think, um, Sometimes um, we, uh, we feel a, a kind of distancing of this happens to them and we don't want to entertain the possibility. This could also happen, happen to me. So pity is uh, something to really keep your antennae out for. And um, you know, if you think about what's going on in India right now, um, you know, can you imagine yourself there? Can you imagine, you know, putting a loved one on uh, a funeral pyre in the street because that's the only way to take care of um, that that corpse? It's very, uh, you know, it's really challenging. Other other comments, please. Thank you so much, and it is a challenge for many people to um, 
feel compassion. I mean, there's a sense sometimes that um, we're not worthy of our own compassion and uh, not worthy and, and recognizing that this is suffering, that, that what you're experiencing, that this is suffering and having that desire to alleviate the suffering. It's no different, no different than offering it to someone else and that we are as worthy of, of compassion as, as anyone else. And that's kind of, of hard for us sometimes because a lot of, um, there's a kind of training that tells us that we should have compassion for others, but not for ourselves. And no different, no different compassion for others, compassion for self. So thank you for that beautiful expression, Brian. One of the, um, Years ago, I read, and I think this was Tanisaro Bhikkhu, but a discussion of, of um, forgiveness that said that forgiveness is when you are not wishing sort of harm for the sake of harm to someone. So for example, um, we can wish for justice and appropriate response and, um, but we don't wish for someone to suffer just for the sake that they suffer. What we want is an, an appropriate response to, to a harm, but that sense of wanting someone to suffer for the sake of suffering. So you might think about someone in your own past or in your own life who has been um, a person who who hurt you and you might never want to engage with that person again you would like that person out of your life you might like that person to get whatever sort of of help or therapy uh you know what would what would help heal that person maybe, but you don't want that person, you know, you're not wishing bad things for that person just for the sake of wanting that person to suffer. And that actually made a lot of sense to me. I don't know if it, if it will grab you in, in the same way, but that idea that I've forgiven someone when I don't wish for them to suffer just for the sake of suffering. You know, I think about, friendships that have um, broken up in really unfortunate ways. Um, you know, I, I have a history I expect like most people where there are some regrets about how things turned out, but I feel that I've forgiven the other party when I don't have in my heart the desire for them to suffer just for the sake of suffering, wanting bad things to happen um, to them. So, um, that may may or may not accord with what what you were saying, um, Robert. But you know, I, I think um, there's a, a, a meta phrase that I, I use sometimes. I until the pandemic, I um, offered meditation in correctional facilities, and um, one of the meta phrases we used to use sometimes was, "May I find forgiveness for the inevitable harms we bring to one another." And, and recognizing that we all have this capacity to, uh, to harm and often harm without intending to harm through our ignorance, through our, um, through our biases. And so uh, it makes sense to me that forgiveness is, is not wanting that person to suffer just for the sake of suffering, which is not the same as not wanting that person to um, to be punished. That sounds, that sounds really, really wise. And I think, you, and that's such an important point that you made that, you know, understanding someone's behavior, having compassion for someone's behavior is not the same as condoning it. It's understanding, it's having compassion. It's not, it's not condoning it. So that, and, and when we're not, then we're not, we're not judging. We're just, we're understanding. You're, the way you're expressing it, Tracy, is, is sort of, I think, what, 
what uh, Sharon Salzberg said, said, compassion is a way of being in the world. It's a way of being in the world. It's a kind of um, something for us to consider as, as friends to other, other friends. Um, I've been reading a book um, called Conflict is Not Abuse, which is, is not, just to say, I, I've been reading an, an author who really talks a lot about the responsibility of friends and community to really tell the truth when other friends start, um, so as, as Robert's saying, sort of getting on the wrong path and, and what this person was talking about, particularly this author, Sarah Schulman, is that sometimes um, a person will uh, you know, sort of say that the other, other people will, be, will claim to be a victim and will not take responsibility for their part in some sort of altercation or misunderstanding about something that happened. And this author is saying, you know, that often friends tend to be just really supportive of that person and saying that friends have a moral responsibility to encourage a sort of honesty and integrity with their friends. If you are really the friend of someone and your friend is not taking responsibility for their part in something, that if you are truly a friend, you will find a way to, um, to have an honest conversation with that friend. And that's not something that we often do. And that's sort of one of the benefits of having a spiritual community where we're all committed to living with integrity and, and honesty. And that, um, you know, and one of my friends is, um, or, or I, am on one of my tears about some sort of domestic injustice, you know, saying, you know, Patrice, you had, you were part of that. You, um, you know, it's not all his fault. You contributed to that. It's the, the sort of, of um, and I, I think as, as Robert was saying, you know, that, that this sort of went on and on and on and none of the other officers intervened and, and stopped in the long history of Derek Chauvin being with the Minneapolis police force and having lots of incidents of, um, of misbehavior that were, was documented. Nothing really came in to stop that. So both on our small level of our friends and our spiritual community, and also in our, our workplaces, you know, we all have a responsibility to, um, to tell the truth when we see harm happening so that that harm is, um, is mitigated. And it's not an easy, easy thing to do, which is why it's really important to have really good spiritual friends who support us in, in doing that. So I see we're just over nine o'clock. So I'm going to um, end by sharing the merit. I really so appreciate um, everyone's kind attention tonight and everyone's participation. And um, if I have misspoken in any way, I, I apologize. So let's, um, let's offer the merit, this wonderful act of imaginative generosity. If there's any goodness in our practice, any benefit or blessing, we would, if we could, gladly, happily, joyfully share it. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our friends, our family, our community, to persons we like, to persons we don't like, to persons we know, and all those persons throughout the world that we don't know. And in addition to all the two-leggeds, we would offer to share the merit with the four-legged, the many-legged, the winged, the scaly, the slithery. We would offer this to all beings everywhere. May all beings find a path of peace. May all beings 
be free from suffering. Thanks so much for being here tonight.